Hello folks, and today's little video is something completely different again. This follows up from a recent visit to the National Rail Museum in York, and there underneath the Lancashire and Yorkshire training layout are a few examples of some mechanical interlocking. This being one example I noticed, just sat there on the floor, and it's quite an interesting bit of mechanical locking. As you can notice in the image, we have some mechanical locking that is conditional, but it's not in the same tray, it's between trays. Now, having got in touch with some colleagues out there in the locking world, they've sent some information through. So firstly, thank you to Martin and also to Mick for providing some locking drawings to show how this works. And we really need to go a little bit more into what you're actually looking at here before I kind of describe it in the diagrams. It is quite an interesting bit of locking. I'd say it's interesting on the same level as a London Northwestern Stowell Diamond. So we'll dive in a bit deeper. So what are we looking at here? Well, let's pick up on a few things to start with. There are some locking pieces and some sliders, which I'll name in a minute, they all have names. This little piece you can see here is a bridge that goes across the locking tray and it's important because normally there's a solid bit of locking tray there, which you can see on either side. But here, this piece of locking tray has actually been milled out. It's been milled out here in the middle. There's a reason for that. There's a piece called an expander, which needs to move up and down. And that's what that's for. So obviously with that locking tray missing, there'd be nothing to keep that sideways movement of these locking pieces in place. So this is merely just a bridge over the top, but still has a slot cut in through the locking there, through the locking support tray, to allow that expander to move up and down. So looking at the locking trays here, we can see the tappets directly operated by the levers. We can see the locks, such as this lock here, which is riveted to this bar, as you can see, going across. So it operates off another bar on the other side. These locks will engage into tap slots in the tappet, which will come down. I'll show you one of them in a minute. And here is one of those slots on number four that you can see. So as we operate the bars across here, we can see that it will push this lock sideways out. As it does, it hits this expander. Now this expander can go sideways. However, it's already touching up against this piece here on the blue portion. So it can't really go right. It's only allowed to go down because there's only a gap here at the bottom to go down. So as you can see here, as the lock moves sideways and hits the expander, the expander can't really go to the right hand side, but there is a gap to go down so it can travel downwards. And in traveling downwards, it pushes the bottom of the expander, which sits underneath this bridge that I mentioned in the locking tray, downwards. As it pushes the expander downwards, you can just see the top half of it here, just hidden on the top of the picture. As that pushes downwards, it hits this other locking piece here. And that also needs to go downwards, but it isn't provided with a path to go anywhere downwards. Instead, this locking piece here can move sideways out of its way if it's free to do so. So as the expander pushes downwards onto this locking piece in green, the green locking piece is forced to go downwards, but can only go sideways into the gap. So it has some free locking there in the gap, but if there's no locking, it will drive against the piece here, pushing it sideways, thus giving you your conditional. Here is the milled out piece I mentioned in the locking tray. These are two parts of the locking tray that should be solid all the way across, but this piece has been milled out. And over the top of that is that bridge piece that we saw. This has just been removed, obviously, so you can see everything's going on underneath in the locking diagram. So let's look at the pieces themselves that make up this conditional locking. So we have standard locks as such, much in the same way you would have dead locking in any lever frame, one locks two, Count of ice, two locks, one. We have the expanders. These are the conditional pieces that work with the lifters, which we'll see in a second. The expanders allow vertical movement up or downwards once operated on by another lock. And that's what this sliding face is for here. This small top face is to push upwards in from one tray to the next tray. The lifting portions or portion is operated on by the expander. So as the expander would push down upon this, it would be forced to push downwards. If it has free movement, it can travel downwards. However, it's only limited to left and right hand movement within the tray on these walls. 
So it forces itself to move left or right, thus pushing on a lock downwards using this sliding face. We'll see that in a minute on a locking diagram. As you can see from the locking trays, it's shown with a slight side view here, there is a lower portion to the tray and an upper portion to the tray. This is mirrored over here. So you have the lower portion and the lower portion and the upper portions in the upper portions. You can fit multiple rods across in the same tray. And again, we have this all mentioned. So the plunger or the tappet, the box itself, the locking tray, the bride lions, the expanders, the lifters, the drivers, and another bridle at the bottom. In this example, you can see how everything is mirrored around and turned upside down to make it to work. So for instance, this expander can only slide downwards. This expander slides upwards. So with no expense spared, we've made a weight and wooden model. It's probably the easiest way to describe it. So what we have here, this is the tappet with its notch cut into the lock. This is a lock. There's various bits that I've left out of this just to make life easy for you. These are the bride lions that go across. And what we have is an expander. And we have a lifter. This is the bridge piece in here. So as you can see, we should have a bit of a locking tray support here and here, which is what these notches are cut into this piece for so that they sit up against the locking tray and can slide slightly sideways. You may notice in the locking drawing, there's actually a little gap here and a little gap here that allows that sideways movement. If this bride line was operated on, it has a flat bar against which operates on the expander. So it pushes against the expander. If the expander is free to move sideways, it'll move sideways. It'll just slide sideways, no problem. It won't operate upon this at all. If, however, it's not free to move sideways, e.g. this piece here was just stuck up against there, the only movement it has is to slide sideways. So this will push upwards like that. Now it is limited on movement, obviously, because the piece can move in and out of there. However, as it moves up, it then pushes the expander upwards against the lifter. And the lifter has a bit of free movement in it as well. However, if that free movement's there, this can slide sideways, that's fair enough. If it can't slide sideways, it pushes against this part of a lock here, which operates the lock via the bride line. The bride line then pushes into the notch on the tappet. And that's how the conditional on this type of locking works. It's fairly simple. You have two sets of allowable movements, a small movement here and a small movement here in the expander.